Brazil. Over a thousand miles from the coastline lies the world's largest wetlands, the Pantanal. Lurking inside this sprawling floodplain is the largest concentration of wild animals in all of South America. The Pantanal is a vast wilderness. It's bigger than New York State, it's 10 times the size of the Everglades, and it's unexplored territory. Every year, thousands of wildlife enthusiasts off-road into the 60,000 square miles of wetlands. The tourists come out into an area they're not familiar with, they get screwed up. They get lost, they get stuck. In this case, we have two travelers. They bit off more than they can shoot. Their vehicle is stuck. Abandoning a disabled vehicle in a desperate search for rescue is an error that claims lives every year. There is no real walking out of this area. Where there's great beauty, there's also great danger. And here we are right in the middle of it. Lost in the swamp and searching for civilization, a scenario two of America's top survival experts, Cody Lundin and Dave Canterbury, will experience firsthand. There's predators in this area all over the place. Anaconda, piranha, caiman. These things are all swimming around this water. You never even know they were there until they hit you. And then it's too late. We are sitting now in the screw zone. not shallower, okay? Yeah, it does. We need to find some place where we can open that gear back up. I agree with you. To show what it takes to escape the swamp, Dave and Cody have only what a couple of wildlife enthusiasts might have in their day pack, a machete. That's a good thing. That's a real good thing. An empty water bottle, a magnesium bar to start fires, a small sewing kit, and the backpack itself. It's got some paracord on it right here. That's a huge bonus. I'm sure we can use this for something to look down the line. I want to get out of here before there's a piranha on my privates, so. We'll actually hit the road. Military trained survival pro Dave Canterbury spent years in the Florida wetlands, experience that's crucial to surviving the Brazilian Pantanal. The fact that we're staying soaking wet all the time is a major concern of mine. So what we need to do first and foremost is get to dry land. We need to get the hell out of here. Well, maybe up in these trees, we can find someplace dry. Naturalist Cody Lundin teaches primitive survival techniques in the Arizona desert. And even here, in the wild swamps of Brazil, he's still not wearing shoes. As far as being barefoot, people have been traveling this area with very little clothing on for a hell of a long time, and here I am. But I don't want to get cut, because then I'm bleeding and I'm literally a piece of bait in piranha-infested water. Piranha, carnivorous fish that troll in schools in search of the next meal, can smell blood up to a mile away. Working together, they've been known to take down mammals over 100 pounds. What the hell was that noise? No clue. Looking pretty thick in here. It's like walking through someone's small intestine. Pretty bad. Well, man, I'll tell you what, we're not running out of water anytime soon, that's for sure. So, I don't know, what do you think, daylight? Three, four hours tops? Yep. I mean, we need to start probably, as much as I hate to say this, but hunkering down. I've never said that before in knee deep water. I don't want to be in water when night hits. So, we will look for a safer shelter location before dusk. In a swampy area, a wetland area like this, I need to get high enough off the water so that the predators can't get me. If a caiman comes rolling through here, a big anaconda comes rolling through here, I want to be up in here. I don't want to be down here. So I'm looking for bigger trees that we can put poles across to make a raised bed. Look over here, Cody. We've got some stuff in here we can jam poles into, and we've got a pretty wide spance right here where both of us could get off the ground. How far do you think that we need to be off of the water? 
Well, I think we need to be this high off anyway. If we jam something in here, we're far enough off the water, we don't have to worry about caimans coming up and snatching us anyway. Anacondas might be a different story, but. I like your spot, Dave. You know, it's I'm got a lot of trees. I'm not to it, that's for sure. But. Well, it's the best we've seen. We're losing light. So, you know, let's keep it simple. Just go for a basic framework and see what we have. One of the big advantages to a machete is it's bendable. It's not stiff. So when I take the first angled chop at that tree, when I take the second one, I go straight in. And if I have to, I can bend that machete up to pop the chunk. Yeah. So now I want the V out of this tree. So with this tool being as sharp as it is, I can pretty much just take them off just like that. And limb it off, and it's ready to go. We're going to need a lot of bindage material to lash the shelter together. And the trick with this stuff is you split it. You can see this area here where it actually has a natural split. This allows us to have that pliability that we're looking for to actually tie knots with this stuff. We're going to keep it wet, soak it up, but it has some pretty decent tensile strength. It's more than enough than we need to rig something for us to get off of the water. This is our pretty bitchin' foundation here. Dave and I decided on the triangle because that's where the trees were that had the best options for us to do this, which is very, very typical. In any sort of emergency scenario, you adapt with what you have on the ground. Let me just do the old patented butt test. That's 210 pounds of love on that. Look at that. That's poetry. After addressing potential attacks from below, next is defending against the Pantanal's disease-carrying mosquitoes. These termite mounds will smolder and smoke, and the smoke will keep the bugs away. It may not come off that easy, Cody. Termites' nests are full of small ah. chambers. Got it. Yep. When burned, the limited flow of oxygen allows the nest to smoke for hours, creating a natural mosquito deterrent. We're trying to ward off the bugs the best way we can. The next thing I need to worry about is fire. Right now, I just want the dried hyacinths. It's good and dry. It's a brown color. This is the kind of stuff Cody needs right now. The chance of getting fire in the damp environment is increased with a modern tool. Thank God for magnesium. Magnesium shavings can be ignited by striking a piece of flint against its steel frame, lighting even moist tinder. Dave and I would not be looking at this fire situation in this environment if it wasn't for that modern way to make fire. We're in an environment where everything's pretty much wet. Magnesium burns at 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit. It's in most camping stores all over the United States. Pretty powerful tool to keep your ass alive. Fire is the best natural defense against predators, but sleeping in the Brazilian swamp is a mental game few can handle. We're three to four feet off of water that's full of caimans, full of piranhas, full of anacondas, all things that hunt at night. I've seen many times on alligator farms, alligators and crocodiles coming six or seven feet out of the water to get a chicken that was held out over their heads. It's probably gonna take somebody staying awake all night and just listening the slightest rustle underneath, like that. Flooded areas cannot support civilization. To find it, the first step is making it to dry land. Well, man, I'll tell you what, if I can find a tree that's high enough to get a vantage point, Maybe I can look off the distance and see if I can see some dry land. Did you land on the climb of a tree, then? Unless you got a better suggestion. No, I don't. Neither one of us would recommend climbing a tree if you don't have to, but what are our options here? You have to weigh the risk versus the reward. It's a risk of mechanical injury, but if I could get above the canopy and see something of dry land, we know what direction to travel. Dave, 
is this not going to happen? Oof. Coming up. Is that you? Something just moved by me. Even though dry land is in sight, the battle to stay out of the dark waters isn't over. There it is. Ooh. Look at the teeth on that thing. The way out is to have something that floats. To escape the swamp, Cody has a plan. I've done a lot of stuff using fire hollowing stuff out. But Dave's not sold. To take on a task that burns thousands of calories is foolhardy and it's deadly. Keep going. Uh -oh. In Brazil's uncharted Pantanal swamp, getting to dry land is the best strategy to find civilization. But climbing high for a vantage point is a measured risk. Oof. Well, this tree's gonna break. This tree's gonna break. This thing's dead. This thing's a death trap right here, buddy. I don't know if it's because they're growing this wet area all the time, but the tops of these trees seem to be dead. Right now, there could be water around us in all four directions, and one might be only a mile to dry land. The other three might be 10 miles. Now, we've got to take a guess. So, directional, Cody, east is staying in Brazil, west is going toward Bolivia. So I think we obviously need to head east. What do you think? I think so, yeah. There's east, our known direction of the morning sun. Following the sun works best when it's low to the horizon. For midday travel, a compass is the only surefire way to tell direction. But it's a tool Dave and Cody don't have. 100% silk scarf will put an electromagnetic charge in the needle that will make it point north-south. So I've been rubbing this for a couple minutes. I'm just going to try to tie a string around it. You need one of a couple different things to magnetize that needle. You can magnetize it electrically by using the positive and negative ends of a battery. You can magnetize it using a magnet, or you can take a silk scarf and you can rub the needle in one direction to give it a static electric charge, very similar to what you'd have if you walked barefoot on a piece of carpet and touched something and got shocked. Once north-south is determined, the sewing needle can be used to aid in direction after the sun is too high or under the cloud cover. I'm just gonna try to free float it in the air and see if it works. So we would hope that this thing's gonna hang at a 90 degree angle to the sun, pretty much. That's pretty damn close. That is pretty close. That's a ballpark but I'm not putting all my eggs in that no, basket. No, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket with something like this, no matter what. Yeah. But for general north, south, east, west direction of travel, I don't think it's too bad off. We just need a, a general direction. OK. I think this will give it to us. OK. Eastward ho, then? Yeah. We have to rely on general direction of travel. Hopefully, we're going to find dry land. Walking through the wetlands out here is utterly exhausting. A lot of the dangers are unseen. And what that does to the psychology of someone in a stress situation, it plays hell with it. Cayman, making noise, man. Is that, is that the noises they make? It's the hidden stuff that's freaking us out just as much as the physical force it takes to burst through this wetland area. Hey, come here, man, look at this. You got a river out here, man. That look like dry land over there to you? It looks drier than here. Heavy duty trees out there, man. Is that you? No. Something just moved by me. Cody and I have got to cross this river. And I know there's cane in this water. So the safest thing for us to do in a two man cross is to get something that will float for us both to hang on to. And the problem with crossing water like this is the more noise you make going across there, the more chance you have attracting predators like caiman. So I think we just take this thing and keep it between us, eh? And that way, at least we got something to hang on to and we're staying together. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. You want the front or the back? Give me the front up here. OK, man. 
This place is full of predators that eat meat. One thing you do not want to do in this environment is be prey. You don't want to splash around. You don't want to make noise. You want coordinated, rhythmic stuff and putting out that vibe rhythm of just everything is normal, don't eat me. It's stabilizing out. Okay, okay. It is dry land. Oh man. Holy crap. Anyone in this situation who found themselves in waist deep water, who had to spend a night in predator infested stuff and found this dry land, you almost want to break down and cry. It's like finding water in the desert. It's a hugely emotional experience. Holy cow. Your feet are wet. You think? <laughs> They won't dry out there as fast as yours will, that's for damn sure. Well, you could save all this hassle, Dave, if you just went barefoot. <laughs> it's not every guy's cup of tea, I understand that. Nope. Dry land and a river are both navigable choices to finding civilization. Why don't we just poke up around here and recon? All right, man. You want to go that way, I'll go this way? OK, 10 minutes or so. All right, man. We're on a new piece of real estate here called dry land, and I want to explore that a little bit to see if we want to stay, figure out a game plan to get out of here, or push on. In a survival situation, you have to set priorities and goals. And our goal was to find dry land, and we found it. Problem is, I'm starting to figure out real quick from this recon, this is an island that's surrounded by water. The last thing we're going to do is get back in water or go swimming again. So we're going to have to dry out and decide what's next on the priority list. I have a kind of a harebrained idea. I have a heavy background in primitive technology in studying indigenous peoples and how they made stuff work. And the number one way the Guato people got around in the sweatland via boat, they were floating. That's how they did it. The Guato were an indigenous nomadic tribe in the wetlands of South America. They spent their lives traveling these swamps and canoes, created by using fire. I've never made a dugout canoe using fire, but I've made lots of stuff with fire. It's hot, dirty work. Now, the pro to that is fire will do a lot of the work. That's the beauty about using fire as a tool to burn out a concavity. Coals can carve out the center of a tree trunk, but the process takes days, expending energy on a project that could sink. What we don't have is a real intimate working knowledge of what the Guato did to pull this off, but I think common sense will go a long way in at least roughing something out that's gonna float so that we're not total caiman bait. So I'm gonna talk to Dave and see what he says. All right, man. We're surrounded by water here. I know that. Come here, I want you to check something out. What I'm thinking about is the Guatal people here obviously used a lot of dugout canoes. So I'm looking at this log and I'm seeing a hell of a lot of work up front. But if it works, I'm seeing a ticket to ride cruising through this wetlands in style. Yeah, I mean, we're talking a couple days worth of work here. It's going to be a load of work, Dave. So that's a couple days worth of calories that we haven't had that we need to find to take on a task that burns thousands and thousands of calories without anything to eat is foolhardy and it's deadly. I've done a lot of stuff using fire hollowing stuff out, and I don't want my ass half submerged in Cayman piranha soup. In the Brazilian Pantanal, the presence of a river changes survival priority. Following it downstream is the best strategy for reaching civilization but the predator-infested waters of the swamp require a boat. I'm not disagreeing with you that we need something to float in, you know, and I don't think a regular raft is gonna keep us away from the Caymans and all the other that's in this water. But, I mean, we're talking a couple days worth of work here. I know that. I like the idea of the canoe. I love canoes. I think they're great. I've got one in my backyard. The problem I've got is, in this situation, you have to have caloric intake in the form of food. There's a lot of prep work in this, but fire will be doing a lot of the work. Right. 
It was done for thousands of years by the people that lived here. They did it for thousands of years with hundreds of thousands of calories in their hand when they were doing it. We don't have that. If we can't find the food to do this, it's probably a no-go, but then what? It's like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. This is a super high-risk project. It's gonna be loads of work up front, which should get easier. And the payoff, if it works, will be massive. If it fails, we're screwed. I guess we'll just take it for granted we're gonna find something to eat, and I'll go see what I can find. It's not a pleasant thing, you know, but... I'm with you. Let me go see what I can find. Just like the Guato people made canoes with fire, they also hunted a dangerous predator with only a bow, piranha. There's a lot of small minnows swimming around in here like this. If there's minnows in here, there's bigger fish feeding on those minnows. So I'm gonna make a bow to hunt piranha. I'm just gonna cut a hardwood and just make a stick bow out of it. Right now, I'm just trying to chop a little bit of girth out of this thing, so I basically am forming a limb in the bow. I don't wanna take any of the bark off the back of it, because that bark will help give it stability and keep it from breaking. The native Guato people strung their bows by weaving vines. But for Dave, 500-pound test parachute cord is a tool he can find endless uses for in the wild. Paracord makes a great improvised bowstring, and there's about a five-foot piece of paracord on this pack. So now I have to string this bow, and to do that, I'm gonna put it between my legs, and I'm actually gonna take a loop around this bow to create leverage, and I'm gonna pull the bow down toward me, like this. And I'm gonna wrap that off a couple times and let it stretch, because this paracord's gonna stretch. And I'm going to stress the bow. All I want to do is get it used to flexing. Then I can tighten the string down more. That's a freaking bow. The way out of this wetland is to have something that floats. It's a lot of work up front, but if I put myself into a Guato mindset, I think it will get easier. A thinking person would say, screw your dugout canoe, just make a raft dude and huck fin it down the river. Well, that thinking person isn't in Cayman, piranha-infested anaconda territory. I don't want my ass dangling in water going down a stream where I'm on the menu. So you can see, even with this machete, I've got a pretty serious divot here already. I've been chopping for about 30 seconds to a minute and I already have a large section of this removed. It's a lot of work, it's a huge commitment of calories, but it's, it's doable. And you can see from this that it's actually making progress fairly quickly. The most tedious part of this is the initial start. And fire later on, we'll do the majority of the work after that. I'm gonna see if I can find an arrow shaft. Okay, here's a stand of bamboo right here. And this is pretty much what I'm looking for, for arrow material. I want to find something pretty small in diameter, maybe a little bit bigger than a pencil. Once the bamboo is cleared, it's split four ways and sharpened to create a four-pronged fishing gig. I need a stick and slide it in between the first two. And then I'm going to break another stick and slide it down between the other two and tie that split in place. What I have when I'm done with that is basically a four tine gig point with four spear points on it. That's an arrow that I can shoot at fish. Most of the machete work is done. I have a lot of experience using fire as a tool to hollow out concavities. I'm simply adding coals from the fire into the holes, and the fire will now do most of the work. It doesn't require a lot of physical labor on my part, but I think probably the way I look speaks for itself. Um, it's a lot of work. These shady areas around the bank right here are the exact areas that fish will be laying in, you know, thinking they're safe. Where'd you go, buddy?
There it is. This is perfect. Damn it! The mist. Crap. Working on this canoe forces us to gather food because it's going to take a lot of caloric intake to make sure that we can get this canoe done. A high-energy food source like piranha is key to any survival mission. A single fish can contain over 30 grams of protein, an immediate injection of energy. There's one over here in the shade. There it is. <laughs> there you go. All right, this is what I'm talking about. Now we got some fish, we got some meat, we're ready to go. Now, Cody's canoe idea is looking a little better to me, but I gotta see if there's any more in here. That's two. Look at the teeth on that thing. That's why these things are so fierce. With a long day of hollowing out the canoe ahead, Cody addresses the next survival priority, disinfecting water. Water disinfects over time via heat, so I don't need to boil this water. Boiling it could destroy the plastic bottle, but pasteurization is possible and just as effective. We should be able to have this water reach temperature to destroy all harmful waterborne pathogens while still having the container to drink out of for at least a time or two or three. Slowly heating water to 160 degrees for about 40 minutes will make it safe to drink. It's work, okay, but it's also work puking your guts out, crapping your pants. Hey, brother. Look at you. A couple piranha there. Look at the teeth on those yeah, things. Yeah, pull that lip back, man. They're nasty. Ugly. Look at that thing. Damn. They're nasty. I've never seen anything like that. Got yeah, a fire. Got to fire them up, man. Sweet. So I'm going to drop my pack, and I'm going to go cut a few poles for the shelter, because we got to get on that, too. Sounds good. All right, man. If you look real close at these fish, that's what you're dealing with. This thing is just made to rip chunks of meat off. I'm glad I'm ripping chunks of meat off of it. Piranha are not the Pantanal's only deadly predators. Jaguars hunt this area after dark. Staying overnight requires a shelter that will protect against a surprise attack. What I need to do now is start building the basic structure of this debris hut. It's fairly simple, fairly quick. I'm turning all these palm fronds so that the channels are up on the leaves. That'll channel any water if it does rain right off the shelter. I need to pile debris on the shelter, about three or four inches thick. If predators are going to come into this camp, like jaguars, I want them to come facing me where I can see them coming. This gives us a frontal attack advantage. We can put a fire out here to keep them at bay. Check it out. Oh, yeah. They're both done. Bones, too, huh? Look at that. Man. That's a lot of meat on a fish of this size. Mm -hmm. yeah. They come with their own built-in toothpicks. I'm just going to sit on my ass here and eat. All right, ma'am. I'll be right back. some fish, so we got the calorie game pretty well whipped. Mm -hmm. And uh, water, got fire, and we got shelter. We're working on our transportation. We'll know real quick if that boat's going to pay off or not. The more I think I know about my craft of primitive technology, the more inept I feel, you know? It's just, it's a humbling thing. To take on a project like that, that big, yeah, it, it's tough. You know, this canoe is a big commitment, and to say that I'm happy about it right now would be a lie, but we've made a decision together as a team to work on this canoe. And I hope that sucker works, man. 
Dual survivals, art of self-reliance. The problem with fishing with a bow is refraction of light off the water. Refraction is the bending of light that occurs when it enters water, creating an optical illusion. The fish is actually in a different spot than you think he is when you're looking at it, and you have to compensate for that with your aim. So you have to aim lower than you think you're going to shoot the fish, or you'll miss him. You'll shoot over top of him. There you go. Brazil's Pantanal waterways are a super highway for finding civilization. But in one of the most dangerous swamps on the planet, traveling down this river requires one thing, a vessel that keeps the entire body out of the dangerous waters. This is a hardwood log right here, buddy. Dave and Cody have spent two days doing as the natives did for centuries, building a fire-burned canoe. Dave and I agreed up front that we were doing the work together. I'm going to burn. He's going to do some chopping. We're kind of working on this thing from the inside out and from the outside in to get the shape that we want. We can burn this log out all day long and make a great big punch bowl out of it, but it's going to roll over in the water. You've got to make this thing look like a boat for it to act like a boat. Anybody that's ever tried to stand up on a floating log knows all it does is roll in circles. It's not going to matter where it's got a hole burning in the middle of it or not. It has to have a bow and a stern cut into it. We're going to have to carve the front like a shovel nose down at an angle this way. And we'll have to keep the sides straight like they are. And then I'll have to start working on the back and do virtually the same thing, just a little shallower angle. Here in the parent and all, it's still hot. I'm still wet with sweat. As you can see, this log's still smoldering on the inside. So it's still very, very hot right here. And we're dehydrating constantly. Intense physical activity can suck liters of hydration from the body each day. You know, I'm only going to get so much time out of that to disinfect water. And I want to be able to try to develop some sort of container to hold water when that plastic bottle fails. This is an akuri palm here. I want to try to get that seed pot, because I can use that as a container. And that is one hell of a seed pod. A single akuri pod contains thousands of seeds for new palm trees. Looks like I'm giving birth. The watertight shell protects them from predators until they're ready to germinate. It's very rare to have an indigenous waterproof container right off the bat. You know, right now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find some food. And what I'm looking for is to see if there's any peccary in this area. They're a fairly large pig. It would be a lot bigger meal for Cody and I than these small piranha that we're catching now. <laughs> right now, this is what I did not want to find. This is the jaguar track. And jaguars are dangerous animals. They're known man eaters. They're definitely at the top of the food chain in this area of the Pantanal. You can see that track engulfs my hand completely. That is a 300-pound man-eating freaking monster the size of a tiger. This track being here means that I need to look at camp security a whole lot heavier. Now I got to set up some kind of a trip wire that will have a triggering system because I saw a fresh track out there that I don't like. And in this situation, you would want something to warn you that that predator was coming into your camp. This is what the natives call chicken guts. It's one of the strongest binds in the Pantanal. I want to make a paddle flapper, basically, a noise-making device that will flap up against something, just like you used to put cards in your bicycle spokes and hit the forks that it went across. Blah, 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 blah. That's what I want. Dave's improvised tripwire requires vines strong enough to hold under tension and a simple noisemaker. This might be what I'm looking for. Nobody's going to sleep real soundly in a situation like this anyway, so you just need something that's going to make enough noise to wake you up. When the line is tripped, the vine uncoils, rattling the palm leaves. I would have done it right there, just about. But for it to work, the vine needs to hold extreme tension. If you can't get something set up like an early warning system, 
to give you some kind of camp security that you can rely on, then you've got to stay awake all night. It's got to be tight. Time in the dangerous wild is always working against survival. With each passing day, an escape route becomes more urgent. What I'm doing now as the final burnout is to light a fire literally in each concavity that's been created with embers for the last several hours and give it a final burn. It's a rush to, to actually flip this canoe and see all of the stuff that fire can accomplish. It's really kind of a, it blows your heart up. Your time spent on that boat is going to be greatly appreciated tomorrow. You know, there's no saying it's going to float just because it's a hollow log and we put some sides in the bottom stern on it. I think it'll float. I'm nervous about the gee whiz. Right. You know, does it float upside down? I'm more worried about how much water it takes on, right. you know, than I am at flipping over. Do we have it thin enough that it's not going to, with our weight, take on enough water to straight sink? Tomorrow's either a celebration or... Or become fish bait, one of the two. Coming up, the team's worst fears are realized. Oh, 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 But giving up isn't in Dave's game plan. I'm getting this canoe to float, come hell or high water, or I'm going to die in a sun. The most important survival strategy is a carefully planned escape. And in the Brazilian wetlands, Following a river is the best route to civilization. But spending days constructing a canoe is a gamble that could literally sink the mission. What do you think, man? I just want to keep checking some of these sides to see if I went too deep. I think it's pretty good, man. I think we ought to put it in the water. I guess that's the ultimate test. There's a hell of a lot of work in something like this. And right now, it's a hope and a prayer because we don't even know if the damn thing's going to float. So we bust our asses. It's been done for thousands of years just like this. All we can do now is drag it down to the water and see how it works out. Here it is. Let's see how heavy this sucker is. Oh, <sighs> Two, 300 pounds. To properly function, the canoe will have to remain buoyant while carrying the weight of two 200-pound men. Total piranha power here. Ooh. Real easy, because I don't want that front end to scoop. Keep going. I'm pushing down a little bit on just this. Just let it kind of float as it goes, man. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> pull back just a little bit. OK. Just anchor that on the shore. Got it? Yep. sucks. Can you feel the boat? <laughs> Is it still there? I'm standing in it. Well, not everything works the first time. Plan B. It makes a great set of underwater stairs. It's not a, not a total loss. Yeah, I failed with the boat. The bottom line is I made a giant decoration that couldn't even take my weight and instantly sank when I got into it. But the bigger disappointment is if I let it take my attitude down, because that kills people in a survival situation. 
you let your attitude get out of control, then you already are dead. The worst thing that could happen right now is for Cody or I to start pointing the finger and saying, I told you so. You have to work as a team. I got another plan. We flip the over. All the air pockets in here, and we just ride on top of the If we take bundles of this wood that grows right here along the bank and put them on each side with outriggers tied and lashed to the bottom of the boat and make like a catamaran out of it. I think that's, that's the only option short of, of having a ceremonial Viking funeral pyre burning it and throwing it out there. All right, well, let's just get on that then okay. so we can get the hell out of here. OK. Lash five of these poles together, make it float better like a catamaran. So I just need to lash this in a few different places and make sure it'll stay together. I'm getting this canoe to float, come hell or high water, or I'm gonna die in this. Okay, round two. Round two. You got it, stable? Yeah, man. You ready? I'll give us a push. Yeah, man. Seems like it's gonna cut it? Yeah, we are. We're all right. In any emergency situation, you're going to have failures. It'll let your attitude go down because of little bumps in the road. I refuse to do that, you know, because that's what takes you down long term, not just in a survival situation, but life in general. Yeah, what is that? Well, let's keep paddling. Yeah, let's get down there, man. Look up here in front of us, man. I see it. Looks like a ranch up here. It looks good to me. We're going there, huh? Yeah, I would say so. Another one down? Yeah. All right, man, let's get over there. OK. All right. Anything would be a hell of a lot better than this damn raft, I know that. In the military, you're taught you never give up until you just can't go on, period. We made it. That's what counts. Situation like this, that's the most important thing. Never, never give up.